Sin City Preacher, Brother Luke, sent me his challenge video. He sent it to me some time ago to my 1689 Baptist channel. Apparently he thought it applied to me because I claim Lordship Salvation. Here's a snippet of his challenge. I issue a challenge to everyone who thinks works are required for salvation. I'm going to challenge you to do three things. One, tell us all the good works that you are constantly doing. <laughs> I suspect the people who are not emphasizing works are the really the people who are doing the most work. And two, tell us that you have not sinned since you got saved. Now here is where all the liars and hypocrites will be exposed. And three, I challenge you to explain, interpret, and refute all the faith alone verses listed in the description of this video. I'm going to answer this question my own way, not necessarily in the way he formed the questions. First question, do I believe I am or ever have been sinless since my salvation? No, I sin daily and have never claimed to be sinless, nor have I ever claimed that any Christian can ever attain sinlessness in this life. The Bible says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Apparently because I claimed I believed in Lordship salvation, that means I believe in sinless perfection. But more on that later on in the video. I'm going to combine the next two questions into one and answer it in that way. He is asked to list my works and how obedient do I need to be to prove I am truly saved. So I think it's safe to combine these two and ask it this way. How many works do I have to have to prove I am truly saved? Or what works do I need to be saved? Here's a snippet of another video where he asked this question. How much work is enough? What, what works does God re require of me? Since I do not disagree with the scripture list he gave on faith alone, I will leave it as part of his combined question and will not address it. We are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Now as for works, there is no set amount of works that is infallible proof of salvation. Neither is there a set lack of works that is infallible proof that the person is not saved. Remember how the false prophets in Matthew 7 held up many seemingly great works to Jesus. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? But in verse 23, Jesus calls their works works of iniquity. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There will be many law-keeping hypocrites with what looks to us like great godly works that will go straight to hell because they are trusting in those works instead of Christ alone and His imputed righteousness. Therefore, this proves that there is no amount of works that we can point to in our lives that can give us infallible proof that we are truly saved. But doesn't Paul say that we are to examine ourselves? Yes. But if we examine ourselves with the thought of, if I stop doing this, or if I start doing that, then I will know that I am saved. I am just proving I am relying on my works to save me. When we examine ourselves, it should always leave us looking to Christ, the object of our faith, not our failures or our achievements. Now the other side of the coin. What lack of works or sins will prove infallibly that I am not saved? Again, there is no set rules to point to. David murdered and committed adultery. How low can a person go into sin? Well, here is what our confession says. The Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 17 of the Perseverance of the Saints. Nevertheless, they may, through the temptations of Satan and of the world, 
the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of the means of their perseverance, fall into grievous sins, and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their conscience wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Now to my fellow Calvinists who claim Lordship Salvation. You really need to consider dropping the term Lordship Salvation because the term is highly confusing and there is no set Lordship doctrine that can be pointed to and no one seems to be in agreement about what it means. I've heard some say we need to call it radical regeneration. But as I have pointed out, that goes against the 1689 Baptist Confession and the Westminster Confession of Faith. And just because you experience a radical change doesn't mean God works the same in everyone. And besides that, we don't base our salvation on experience. We base it on faith alone in Christ alone. Many of the people in cults have experienced a radical change in their life, and they think it's proof that their false religion is right. I, for one, would rather drop the term and just stick with the Bible and the Westminster Confession of Faith. I am tired of the confusion in my debates when I say I'm a Lordship Salvationist. My opponents think I believe, like him, or maybe like him, or just like him, or him, whoa, or him. No, thank you.